make it really interesting for you this morning? Not only do we have a man of God, we've got a woman of God, and another man of God that's going to come and share the word. It will take about maybe 10 minutes apiece. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time. But just walk into the presence of God, allow him to say what he needs to say. Because his whole desire was that we would be worshipers. Man, I would have loved to have been that person that came up to the grave and said, he's gone. <laughs> he's not here anymore. Amen. So you would do me a favor. Amen. This is my sister, my friend. And DeAndre, she's going to come. Dr. DeAndre Boys. And come and share the word with us. Can y'all give her a round of applause as you come? Well, bless the Lord, family. Amen. to share on Resurrection Sunday what the Lord has been sharing with me all week long and um, sometimes you think gosh you know this may not be what you want me to say and then you go into the service and you hear this and you hear that and you like Lord okay you're confirming that you're speaking to me and that what I've heard from you this week is what your people need to hear in this hour and so I want to share with you and I'm going to give you the title right now um, the title is Bought at a high price, but marked down by life. And so we were purchased by the blood of Christ, the priceless blood, matchless blood of Jesus Christ. And yet we find ourselves in the body, in this world, where we're dealing with trouble and difficulty and circumstances and strife and confusion and illness and death and we find ourselves in those circumstances. So it's not Christ that has marked us down, it's life. But the blood still has power and authority. And so I want to share just a few scriptures with you today and take you through what the Lord has been speaking to me. I'm going to start with the death of Christ. I'm going to be reading from three different chapters of the Bible, but they're pretty close together, so you'll be able to follow. Matthew 27 is where we're going to start. Matthew 27. And in this chapter, we see that this is the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This is the time when he was hung for us. And all of our sins were nailed to the cross. I'm going to start at 45, and I'm going to hop around, so just try to follow with me. So the death of Jesus, about uh, verse 45, I'll be reading from the NIV, though you might see the KJV up there, but you'll have your references. Now, it says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. So wanted you to understand that during this time of his crucifixion, uh, you know, as he is getting ready to, and he's in the process of dying, uh, there is darkness in the land. So this definitely tells people that there is something unusual about this man. And I want you to see it from the NIV because when you read it this way, the sixth hour, everyone says, when is that? I don't know, was it six o'clock? Well, it might get dark at six o'clock to nine o'clock, you'd assume, but this is noon. Noon, when the sun is directly overhead, it became dark. From noon until 3 p.m., it was dark just for that time period. Surely the people must have known something great, something grave has happened in this moment because it's dark when it should be light. We go to verse 50 where it says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' res resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So oftentimes people assume that it was only Jesus that was resurrected. But look at what his death did. It set people free, not later, but then. The graves opened. People came from the tomb in that hour. That is amazing, could be quite frightening. 
frightening to see your relative show up on your doorstep, you know, like Pet Cemetery. Sorry to remind you. <laughs> Perhaps we need to get a shovel and a truck because, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but the heart of this, and so I wanted you to see that at that hour, the veil was torn. There was a separation that happened in the place of the Holy of Holies. Now, there was a first covenant or testament or agreement. Then we come into this second testament covenant or agreement with Jesus Christ. And I'm taking you to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, develops this whole conversation about what the first covenant was about. So we know with the Old Testament, during our time of Leviticus and Exodus and Deuteronomy, we understood that there was a way that the priest actually entered in and uh, served at the temple. But then you have the holy priest, the high priest, were the only ones who were able to go directly into the Holy of Holies. They were the only ones who were able to go in where the... Uh, Ark of the Covenant was, and they only did this once a year. So what you find in Hebrews 9, it says, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship. It's talking about holiness. It's talking about this tent, this first section where priests were allowed. And then it talks about behind the second curtain, you have this most holy place. And it says that this is the place where you find that the preparations being made around verse 6 and 7, I'm taking you through. It says, only the high priest goes, but he does this once a year and not without taking blood. Now, he offers this for the unintentional sins of the people. Now, I want you to get this picture. We know that when Jesus died, the veil was torn. So in the first testament, what you find is only the holy high priest was allowed to go into that second place. And when he went into the second place, listen, if he had sinned himself, they would be dragging him out. Literally, they had them tied about the waist, so just in case they didn't make it, they would pull them out. But one thing that this stands out to me, and the word says it, it says that there were a lot of arrangements dealing with washings and regulations of the body. At this particular time, the sins of the people had to do with what food they ate, the people that they touched, were they unclean. It didn't have to do with every aspect of their life. And literally, the sins that they actually absolved them of were the current ones. So anything that you did the next day or the next week, you'd have to, oh, Lord, okay, am I going to get cleansed? And literally, you could imagine if someone went before you to absolve you of your sins, they went. You're like, I don't know, did they forget me when they were praying? A am I sure? You know, is your conscience clear that this person on your behalf gave the best case for you? And so what we find is there was a better way. And Jesus Christ came to bring this better way. And it says in verse 9, it says that you cannot have this perfect conscience of the worshiper. You're not sure if they did it right. But we get in verse 11 when it says, but when Christ appeared, he is the high priest. He came and he did a greater, more perfect thing. Because Jesus didn't go into the Holy of Holies in a tent that was man-made. He went in the Holy of Holies in heaven. When he died, he went into heaven. He purified that space in heaven with his blood. You can read it. They talk about it a bit in Job. Because in that time period, Satan was able to come and talk to the Lord. But when Jesus went in as his sacrifice, his blood purified even the space in heaven that Satan was no longer allowed in. And because he was able to enter into that place, it made it perfect. His sacrifice not only absolved us of our sins of yesterday, but today and ever more. We have access to forgiveness for even the sins of tomorrow. If that does not bless you, I don't know what would. Because we have access to him. And because he's the high priest, he did a better thing. A greater eternal sacrifice. An eternal redemption for us. So lastly, I'm taking you to Matthew 26. And I'm going to tie this in together fairly quickly. Matthew 26, 26. We know this is the time of the first supper, our communion. And you're going to see the link now as I put these together. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, Matthew 26, 26, and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. My body. Understand that his body now is us. We are to partake of his body through one another. 
his body and he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament <coughs> this is the new covenant this is the new agreement between us between God and us a new testament he gave and he says which is shed for many for the remission of sins and he says I will not drink of the vine until I drink it with you in my father's kingdom so I say to you today the veil is torn. You now have access. No longer do you need a man of God or a woman of God to go before you. You have access directly to the throne of grace. You can obtain it at any hour. The body of God was made for us, for strengthening us. And when that veil was torn, it connected us even the more. And it's powerful. The new covenant means that we are connected together. That his blood is ever speaking new and better things in our life for our future. And it speaks all the way into eternity. You have access. So I want to say to you today, if you've not accessed the blood, if you've not accessed the full body of Christ, today is your day of communion. It's the day of true communion, of fellowship, of relationship, of koinonia, where we come together in power as a body and we deal a blow to the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Don't turn away from him in this season. Yes, you might have been marked down by life. Yes, you might have some struggles, but you have access to mercy and favor in this hour. God bless you. Amen. Amen.